Okay, hello everyone, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Uh, getting used to the new warmer weather. Hopefully we can still have a cool spring because we know summer will be hot. So today's class scheduled for May the 15th. But remember half the month is gone. Uh, it's Pablo Picasso, the world famous Cubanist style painter. So we only have one. Last week we had a hybrid of Frida Kahlo and Diego because they were a couple. So but we only have one. We have enough info on this guy to make it uh, enjoyable. So let me go through my steps here, my usual steps. Share the screen. Go to the material. Start the slideshow. And go from the beginning. All right, let me bring up the code. Here we go. HUM 105, Humanities 105, class name, The Intimate Lives of the World's Most Famous Artists, or Artistes, depending on which uh, hemisphere of the United States you're on, or East Coaster or West Coast. All right, so let's get into this. Some interesting stuff with this fellow. All right, so there's a real picture of him as a young man, all right, with his uh, cigar. I mean, sorry, cigar. <laughs> Am I losing my mind? Um, pipe. You know, my father used to smoke a pipe. I never have, never tried it. Okay. So a little background, I always start with some background on the artist because as time goes by, Maybe people that were really famous when I was a kid growing up are not so famous now. And uh, you people are a little bit younger than me, I think. <laughs> hint, hint. So let's get a little perspective on this uh, individual. Pablo Ruiz Picasso, born October 25th, 1881, and died April 8th, 1973. Okay. Unlike a lot of our other, most of our other artists, he lived a pretty good long life. And he was a Spanish painter. This is from Spain. A sculptor. So he sculpted things. Printmaker. Ceramicist. So made uh, pots and different things. Ceramics. And a theater designer. That's pretty new. It's, that's kind of a reach out there to also design a building, a theater as an artist. So this guy is very multi-talented. Or if you remember the term from one of our earlier ones with Michelangelo, a renaissance, more of a modern renaissance man. Okay. So uh, Picasso, who spent most of his adult life in France, even though he was Spanish, a lot of artists you've seen too, moved to France for inspiration. Always seemed to be a group of famous artists in uh, France. Okay. Um, so one of the most influential artists of the 20th century, he is known for co-founding the Cubist movement. That has nothing to do with Cuba, if you think so. Um, there's a phone ringing in the distance. Not good. Uh, anyway, um, it has to do with the shapes of cubes, you know, squares. If you're a Korean, like a gakdugi, right? So his paintings were done in a square-like fashion if you haven't seen them. The invention of constructed sculpture, the co-invention of collage collage is kind of like a mix of things you can do a call like let's say they have a, a painting of collage and different elements are used in there right and for the wide variety of styles that he helped develop and explore so very creative individual not just a, let's say a past maybe a dutch masters artist that just uh, did still life, which was popular. He did even other styles. 
Uh, among his most favorite works are the proto, meaning like original Cubist, Les Demoiselles de Avignon, 1907, and the anti-war painting Guernica, 1937, 30 years later. Take a note of that, still on top of his game, you know. And a dramatic portrayal of the bombing of Guernica, which is a city in Spain, by German and Italian air forces during the Spanish Civil War. Yes, they had a civil war in Spain. So, interesting stuff. Staying on top of his game, even though many years later. Picasso demonstrated extraordinary artistic talent in his early years, painting in a naturalistic manner through his childhood and adolescence. So that means his teenage years. During the first decade of the 20th century, his style changed as he experimented with different theories, techniques, and ideas. After 1906, the Fauvist work order of the older artist, Henry Matisse, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, motivated Picasso to explore more radical, meaning non-accepted styles at the time not non-popular, right? It's like an artist. Okay. Uh, you guys are probably too young, but when Jim Carrey started out and he was his most popular, he uh, was strictly a, a gag man or a comedian. And then he decided he wanted to do serious roles, strange roles, other kinds of things. So those roles were radical for Jim Carrey, and unfortunately, most of those movies were not popular because people, his fan base, uh, only wanted to see him in comedies. So sometimes this works with artists, and sometimes it doesn't. So this exploring more radical styles began a fruitful, which means successful, doesn't mean a lot of fruit grew there, but it's a metaphor, fruit for money, rivalry between two artists who subsequently, which means later, were often paired by critics as the leaders of what is called at that time, modern art. Picasso's work is often categorized into periods. While the names of many of his later periods are debated, this there's not a consensus or an agreement. The most commonly accepted periods in this work are the blue period, 1901 through 1904, the rose period, 1904 through 1906, the African influenced period, 1907 through 1909. Let me step out here. I think I hear where that phone is. I'm going to stop it. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Can't have that phone going off during the uh, lecture. Sorry. All right. So the African influence period, 1907 through 1909, analytic cubism, where they're actually studying it, what it is, what it's about, 1909 through 1912, and synthetic cubism, 1912 through 1919, which is a longer period of seven years. The analytic was only three, also referred to as the crystal period. 
Much of Picasso's work of the late 1910s and early 1920s, so those are 10 year spans, like 1911, 12, 13, and then later 21, 22, up to 29, is a neoclassical style. And his work in the mid 1900s often has characteristics of surrealism. Again, I, I mentioned last week, when we get into Salvador Dali, he's considered the king of surrealism. Uh, and as I mentioned before, some of his most famous pieces, which have been turned into, I mean, I had a tie with it, were these clocks that were melting in the desert. You know, very interesting how he did that. So again, kind of like half real, half not real, you know, other stick figures walking that aren't alive. And so that's uh, surrealism. So his Picasso's work has characteristics of it, but it's not strictly a surrealistic piece like Pablo Picasso, who will be coming up soon. You thoroughly enjoy him. He was about as surreal as his artwork. Uh, his later work often combines elements of his earlier style. So that shows that he experimented with all these different styles and his later styles, he went back and combined them with his early styles, did not forget them which a lot of artists tend to do. Exceptionally prolific, which means did a lot throughout the course of his life. Picasso achieved universal renown, which is universal fame, an immense fortune for his revolutionary artistic uh, accomplishments and became one of the best known figures in 20th century art. Pretty interesting stuff. So here's a drawing of him. So again, you've come to see that in these drawings of the artist from this book, um, they usually show things that were important to him. Okay, so you see this vest here. Okay, that is a bullfighter's vest. So we will find out why they put a bullfighter's vest. And the pants, too, are also from the bullfighter. Um, you see a dog. You see a candle inside of a wine bottle and a rat. Uh, it's probably a rat, not a mouse. So that's showing, that's a symbol of uh, poverty, living without a lot of money. That's his light. He couldn't afford electricity. Right, see a cigarette here, it means he's a smoker. And this is a rendition of one of his art. So you see the cubism? It's like this woman's face is made of these different square and rectangle shapes, right? So that's his uh, most famous for is his cubism. We can get into the hat and other things later, so. Pretty funny stuff. And then of course, these who these people are. Three of these, which uh, stand for, who knows? Maybe it's, should I give it away? Okay. Okay, at the bullfights, Pablo Picasso, born in Malaga, Spain, 1881. Like I said, he was Spanish. Spent a lot of his time in France, so he died in uh, Mouguines, France, 1973. Spanish painter, sculptor, Graphic artist, ceramicist, considered the foremost figure of the 20th century art. Look at this, considered the foremost. So number one, Ichiban. Now we'll go into the intimate part of his life. Okay. Pablo Picasso grew up indulged, which means they gave him everything. Anything he wanted, they gave him by the five women in his household. He hated authority and was not a good student. Interesting, a lot of the prior artists were good students, but not him, possibly because of dyslexia. Do you know what dyslexia is? Okay, um, dyslexia uh, and uh, people like Cher, the singer, Tom Cruise has it. Maybe Dustin Hoffman. Um, 
it's it's a vision disease where the words look backwards to you okay that's a very difficult thing to overcome so you know everything looks backwards or upside down i don't know how you can have that and then be a great artist but these uh, kinds of individuals, they rise to many challenges, okay? So thus, he had trouble learning to read and write. Instead of doing his schoolwork, he would bring a pigeon hoodoo, hoodoo, to class and spend his time drawing it. I, it's hard to understand that the teacher let him do this unless, you know, after reprimanding him many times, he just would ignore the teacher and keep on doing it so that they had no choice but to say, this boy Pablo just uh, likes to draw a pigeon. Uh, he had his first exhibit at age 13. So what does that tell you? He was already, as they call, a progeny, right? He was already super talented by uh, 13. That's unbelievable. And that's when he showed his paintings in the back room of an umbrella store. So I guess he'll always remember that very first showings ever was in the back of an umbrella store. So that's, you know, many comedians will tell you the first comedy club they played at. Actors will tell you the first play or movie they were in. Okay. Continuing. Later, he hung out at the Cafe Four Cats and had an exhibit, exhibit there, too. I wonder how they're hanging out at 13. Kind of young. But the only works that sold were to people whose portraits he had done. He left for Paris from Spain at age 18, wearing his black corduroy suit. So you see the picture that we had, and that's what he was wearing. Just before his departure, he wrote on his most recent self-portrait, I the king, I the king, I the king. So obviously, this person did not suffer from uh, not having confidence. This sounds like a very egotistical person that truly believed in the talent or gift he was given for his uh, art. In Paris, though, he lived less than royally, which means he lived poorly. That's why I told you they had the mouse with the old wine bottle and the candle inside. His home was a garret, you know, much bigger than a shack. He worked by the light of a single candle. He stuck into the bottle, again, not being able to afford electricity. Occasionally, he could not even afford the candle. Wow. That's one thing where you're trying to work by a candlelight and then later, you know, I can't even afford the candle. Wow. Unbelievable. He used books for pillows. Sometimes burned drawings to keep warm. So his own drawings, even if he liked them, he burned them to keep warm if it was a cold winter night. Um... He kept the white mouse as a pet. Okay. So I stand corrected. I guess it was a mouse and not a rat. I don't know if you can keep a rat as a pet. Probably get rabies. And ate fried potatoes, beans, and omelets. When his place was robbed, thieves stole everything but his art. Isn't that funny? They stole his food. I mean, maybe if he even had one dollar, I guess, well, at the time, maybe one franc, French dollar, but nobody touched his art. Remember the other artists uh, where they uh, soldiers shot at it or other people did burn it for uh, fire? So interesting. He was lucky in that sense. His art was not wrong or damaged. Whenever he had enough money, he went to the bullfights, which he had loved as a child, fascinated by the 
bullfighter's lack of fear. So that's why he I pointed out in the picture and a bullfighter's best. Love those bullfights. One of his nicknames for himself was Eye of the Bull. And he liked to play his friends against each other using one as a red flag, and the other as a bull. Some thought Picasso was even built like a bullfighter, strong and powerful, right? So there you go. I guess he said, he spent a lot of time saying charge, charge. And the one friend pulled up the flag and the other friend charged like a bull. I, you know, I can tell you something I found out. When I was growing up, I used to think, well, obviously the bull doesn't like the red cape. It makes him upset. It makes him think of, I don't know, fire or anger. So that's why the bull attacks. But later, I learned that the bulls are colorblind. So I guess it's just the movement of the up and down and the shaking that agitates uh, the bulls. Okay. All right, so they're talking about Picasso's body. Um, he did seem massive, which means quite large, but was only five feet, two inches tall. How can somebody see massive when they're only five feet, two? Wow. Although he never exercised, he was always fit and had unusual stamina. So I guess in today's world, we would say that he had great genes or great genetics because he didn't have to exercise, but somehow he was always fit and had unusual stamina. Stamina means that you're able to do something for a long period of time. Like let's say we'll put it in another, like a sports run. Um, you're a marathon runner. It means you have great stamina to run, what, what is a marathon, 26 miles? Uh, I usually could run one mile and then fall down. So I don't have great stamina. But uh, so he had a lot of stamina. Uh, he could stand in front of a canvas, which is where you paint, for seven or eight hours at a stretch. I can't imagine standing seven or eight hours at a time, let alone painting and having to concentrate. But he could do it. And it said he could do that for the majority of his life. And we already spoke about how he lived quite a long time. Work is the most important was his favorite motto or saying. And he was hugely productive. So if somebody, somebody's motto saying is work is important, it is not surprising that he was hugely productive or did a lot of arts of work. Like the guys just work, 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 work. Yeah. Uh, a master of publicity, Picasso decided early on that the amount of money a painting sold for was directly related to the legend surrounding the artist. It's not what an artist does that counts, but what he is. So what he's trying to say here is that it's really not the most important that the artist art is of the highest level, but what sells his art is his reputation. And you will see, I mean, again, I'm mentioning Salvador Dali, he was a great artist, but his wild life, almost a surreal life, also helped sell his paintings because people say he's one in the same, right? And so Picasso with his penetrating stare, which means he could stare at you and it felt like he was looking inside of you and a lit cigarette constantly between his lips. So in the drawing of him, remember I pointed out the cigarette. So I knew he was a cigarette smoker, but I had constantly, so that means he was smoked many packs. It's a miracle he did not get lung cancer at an earlier age. He radiated, or like they say, his body glowed self-confidence, and he cultivated or put out a fiery image 
That's how people saw him. He looked like he was angry or on fire painting, super confident. He liked to be in an absolute command of every situation. So again, a lot of egotistical people are what we call uh, control freaks, right? Control freaks. He was one too. Although he usually got the adulation, which means the love from the fans that he craved, sometimes it was too much. Oh dear, too much love. Once when he was surrounded by a cheering crowd, yay, Picasso, he took out the gun he carried whenever he left the studio and fired it into the air. Within seconds, the area around him was deserted. Picasso knew everyone. He knew everyone, interesting. Uh, he hid in air raid shelters. Air raid shelters are, you know, and he lived through World War I and World War II and the Spanish Civil War. So when, when the city would find out that the enemy's planes were coming, you know they were going to bomb the city, um, they would sound these alarms, you know, whip, whip, and people would run into these underground shelters. Those were air raid shelters. Uh, and he would do this with the writer Gertrude Stein, a longtime friend during World War I, and gave her advice when her poodle died. So her poodle died in the shelter. Um, I don't know if it was from a bomb, because they were okay, or it just, uh, animals can also, if you didn't know, die of heart attacks. They can get so afraid that they die. He often walked the composer Eric Satie home, doffing his hat. That means taking off his hat and bowing to the other person and saying, good night, Mr. Satie. And he drew a portrait of composer Igor Stravinsky, which was a famous Russian violinist, that military authorities were sure was a secret map. So that's one of your earlier conspiracy theories, right? I know that has to be a secret map the way, you know, Picasso painted that weird Cubanist uh, or Cubist style painting, right? Uh, writer Ernest Hemingway, famous American writer of whom the bell tolls, farewell to arms, uh, came to visit immediately after World War II and bought, <laughs> bought Pablo Picasso a box of hand grenades. Yet he was notoriously notorious, which means famous in a bad way. You want to be famous, but if you're notorious, it's like, oh boy. You know, everybody knows him for doing bad things. So he was notorious for cruelty to friends, other artists, bystanders. That could be you or me at the time, just standing in the street and see him, and he could be rude. It was said that living with him meant wearing armor, the old metal suits that the soldiers used to wear in Europe, for 24 hours a day. So that means, I don't know if they're trying to imply a physical attack from him or just uh, emotional attacks, you know, yelling, what have you, insults. Some of Picasso's romantic relationships were with famous women. Now look at this spectrum here of these women. First, the ballerina Olga Koklova. So there's a physical art, I guess, with the ballet. The painter and photographer Dora Marr and the painter Francois Chilot. So two more painters, or two painters and slash photographer. Uh, and some of his relationships were not. So it sounds like he dated a lot of women, a lot of different women. He would walk up to a woman and say, I'm Picasso. 
you and I are going to do great things together. Very egotistical, or here's a word for you, audacious. Right? He was not good at making decisions and was sometimes involved with two or three women at the same time. Uh-oh, I, I had a feeling. If you're dating all these different women, there's a high chance you're dating a couple at the same time. And he preferred to let the women fight it out over him. Okay, that, that's a big ego. But again, you're a famous artist that people are buying stuff from you at a high price. Next, neighbors didn't always approve of his lifestyle. And at least once threw stones at his windows in protest. <laughs> So they didn't approve too many girlfriends coming in and out of your apartment. So we're going to throw rocks at your windows in protest. Uh, Jacqueline, his second and last wife. So I thought these women were his wives. You remember up here it says uh, ballerina Olga Koklova, Dora Maar, and Francois Gillot. Uh, he only had two wives. So I guess he lived with these ladies which was not a popular thing to do at the time, and was the only person he could stand to have around when he painted. So these other ladies, I guess, bothered him, annoyed him. If he would paint, he had them leave. But his second wife, Jacqueline, she could stay and watch him paint. So very peculiar person, or eccentric, shall I say. Continuing from the top here. Uh, Picasso went to great lengths to uh, entertain his four small children. He would dress up in women's underwear. So I guess that's bra and panty. I don't know about nylons. And he would draw on tablecloths, which you're not supposed to do. Perform magic tricks with paper towels. Uh, prepared birthday dinners made up entirely of different kinds of chocolate desserts. I'm sure the kids love that. No vegetables, no potatoes, no meat, just desserts for dinner. I just wonder if they had a lot of uh, cavities or not. As his children grew older, however, he lost some of his interest in them. Interesting. So... When they were younger, he was an adoring, you know, father. Yeah. Just as he was spoiled by the four women in his home, he was spoiling his kids. But then when they got older, he lost some of his interest in them. That's an interesting psychological insight. His favorite clothes were striped sailor's jerseys. So that's what he was wearing in the drawing. Baggy trousers, which means, you know, a lot of room in the trousers. No skinny fit jeans, right? Turkish slippers, which are pointed at the end slippers. So he preferred the Turkish style. And berets. Uh, berets are the French loose hat that he was wearing in the drawing with the little... Tiny piece of like rice sticking off the top. And he especially liked wearing those after he started losing his hair, which again is common the world over with men who uh, lose their hair. You see an older guy wearing a baseball cap or something, nine times out of 10, he's bald, right? Or going bald. His favorite clothes were, okay, I passed that. He kept his wallet in the inside pocket of his coat, I guess for safety reasons. Maybe there was a lot of pickpocketing, you know, where they take the wallet out of your pants. And he fastened it or secured it with a safety pin for extra security. Either he had things stolen from him as a young man or he was paranoid about having that happen. Friends were amused. At the trouble he had to go to every time. Okay, so again, these birds, cute. 
that he threw nothing away, not even cigarette packs and the paper ribbons from packages. He always locked his studio and absolutely no one was allowed to dust it. So I guess it got very dusty and dirty, but nobody could clean it, probably because somebody damaged one of his works or stole a piece or something. You know, there's many times where people put these cameras now, they have these people come and clean or be nannies and they catch them stealing stuff. So probably that's why. Uh, but it's very strange after you smoked the 20 cigarettes from a cigarette pack and the paper and ribbon, you would throw them away. I didn't use them in his art, so. Eccentric. He kept to a diet of fish, vegetables, rice pudding, grapes, raspberries, crushed in milk. I hope they don't mean they crushed the fish too. Hmm. Maybe it's just the raspberries, I hope. Fish and milk. Uh, I know a guy that did that with beer. That wasn't good either. Uh, large pieces of fresh ginger, probably for flavor. Carrot and pea soup. And mineral water. His mid-afternoon snack was lime blossom tea and toast. Hmm. Kind of minimalist on the eating. Uh, which would explain why he didn't, I guess, become fat, but had stamina. You know, he wasn't like Elvis Presley eating a bunch of cakes and pork chops and fried chicken. Uh, restless, he moved often. It also helps to burn calories. He bought one of his three mansions in the south of France for the price commanded by one of his still lifes, still life paintings, which tickled him, made him laugh. In one chateau, he covered the walls of the luxurious bathroom where his wife would give him his bath with wild jungle beast. Does that, hmm, does that mean dolls or does that mean that they he painted the ceiling and walls of, you know, elephants, lions, gorillas? In his last villa, Notre Dame de Vie, he was protected by electronic gates and guard dogs. There was hardly any tameable animal. A tameable animal is like cats, we tame them, they become house pets, uh, dogs, birds to some extent. But you, you cannot tame a crocodile or a shark or a lion they will eventually attack you and attempt to eat you, right? Uh, so there was hardly any tameable animal he didn't shelter at some point, uh, including a monkey. Monkeys are tameable, but they can still do bad things. Uh, Esmeralda the goat, reptiles. I don't know about reptiles. They're a cold-blooded animal. I don't know if that could be considered a tameable. And numerous Afghan hounds, which are dogs, these thin dogs with long hair. Very unique looking dogs. But again, dogs are already domesticated. As soon as he could afford it, he hired a chauffeur, person to drive him around. Why? This was his feeling. Driving a car is very bad for a painter's wrists, I think. That's just an excuse for him being lazy. He didn't want to drive. He enjoyed people driving him around. Otherwise, driving is not going to damage your wrist. You won't be able to paint because you drive a short distance. Picasso might have liked this book, which is a book we're reading right now, or at least this chapter. After 1945, about six books on Picasso were published each year, and he enjoyed reading them. Knowing that anything he said would eventually show up in the papers, he subscribed to a service that clipped articles for him. So he, unlike a lot of 
stars who say they don't read the, their press clippings. Uh, he actually hired someone to clip them all for him so he could read them all. You know, usually they say, when I first was famous, I read my clippings and most were negative, so I decided not to read them. But he wanted to make sure he read them all. At the public premiere of a documentary about him, he amused the audience by calling out for a second showing and then a third. So again, where any type of artist from an actor, a singer, and they sing and they say, okay, concert's over, people love it so much they ask for an encore. And then sometimes another, sometimes the singer will do it. But here, he was the one calling for an encore. He said, did you enjoy the documentary about me? Let's watch it again. So, again, this goes back to my general statements about this fellow's ego. I guess he really enjoyed uh, seeing himself up on a screen. But gradually, as the years went by, he cut himself off from almost everyone except his fans. He even refused to meet his grandchildren. Wow. It's one thing if you don't want to meet your fans. Most like William Shatner and most of the Star Trek people, they, they don't go to Star Trek conventions. They're like, no, thank you. I don't want to be there. Or like Ringo Starr of the Beatles has never been to a Beatle convention. This doesn't feel comfortable there, right? But to refuse to meet your grandchildren, that's another issue. At his 80th birthday party, for which 4,000 invitations were sent, he arrived escorted by police. Why would he be escorted by police? Be afraid someone was going to hurt him from his own family? He remained vital and prolific. And in his 90th year, did 200 paintings. So at 90 years old, did 200 paintings. Again, it's one thing to have stamina in your 20s, 30s, even 40s. But people at 90 are not famous for having a lot of stamina. He was still working the day he died, two years later, of heart failure. His last words were to his doctor, you are wrong not to be married. It's useful. <laughs> yeah, okay. So look at that. He, his motto was work is the most important. And he died basically when he was working. I guess he had a heart attack. They took him to the hospital, told the doctor they couldn't bring him back. He died without a will. So we don't know what a will is. It's a contract and a document that states whatever you own. And this is very important, very, very important for famous artists, uh, rich actors, actresses, sports players. It has to say who gets what money, right? Uh, and he sounds pretty normal here, Picasso. Uh, even though he died without a will and his estate valued at hundreds of millions of dollars, it was eventually divided between Jacqueline, which was his second and last wife, three children, and two grandchildren. So I don't know how they did it. I guess a lot of people agreed and came together and didn't want to fight. And a number of people got things. But I've also seen... Like it's very famous to have these actors are from, from the 50s or 60s or 70s and then they died recently and uh, they left nothing to their kids. Their older kids are now like 40 or whatever. And they left all the money like the actor was married to the kid's mom in the 50s and 60s and then divorced. And the last wife, she could be wife number two or three the guy in, as a senior citizen leaves her everything and the young guys are like, what the hell happened here? Or you get the other crazy version of the famous lady died and she left her $20 million 
to her pet chihuahua, Yo-Yo. It's like, and it's in the will. She even had a will. So, you know, the last husband, the kids, the grandkids, nobody gets anything. I don't know how the chihuahua Yo-Yo can spend the money. What, where does it actually go? It's just going to sit in a bank, I guess. But they do that because they're eccentric folks. All right, let's get into more of the artworks here. Pablo Picasso. Okay, Picasso's early days of poverty are known as the blue period because everything he painted when he was poor and young, self-portraits, beggars, harlequins, which is another name for clowns, and musicians such as the old guitarist came out sad in blue. So people will say, see, since he was so poor, he was probably not happy and wanted fame and wanted money, but was not happening. So his feelings are expressed in his art. So all these different paintings came out sad and blue because his lifestyle at the time was mostly sad and blue. Next, then followed the pink period when Picasso began his first real romantic relationship and they stayed here with a neighbor and he grew happier. Love will do that for you. Its first picture is considered to be the young girl, this is the title of it, with a basket of flowers bought by Gertrude Stein, remember his friend. Paris Papers called another pink period work, Family of Saltimbanques, grotesque and infamous, but the spectacular price paid for the painting of six circus performers changed Picasso's life. That took him completely out of poverty. Um, grotesque, uh, let me try to help you with uh, grotesque, okay? There's some things that happen that obviously we don't like to see, okay? So, for example, um, you're lucky if you see a dog get hit by a car. I mean, you're not lucky if you see it, but if, if you do see it, you're lucky if it hits the dog and the dog just, you know, flies to the curb and just dies. You don't see any blood. And the dog's not screaming or anything. It just, it's just like it knocked it out. You're lucky. Uh, for example, one time I saw a small weenie dog, those little dogs that look like a hot dog in... Uh, I was a teenager at the time, and a car hit it and basically cut the hot dog in half. And the dog's guts came flying out hot into the street, and the dog started screaming. Didn't scream for long, but that is something grotesque. Just seeing a dog hit and it looks like it's knocked out is not good to see, but it's not grotesque. So anything grotesque is a little more, a little too bloody, you know, something like that, but it sold for a giant amount of money, the family of Saltimbanks. Uh, now we're going back to what was stated earlier, the Guernica is Picasso's response to the German bombing of a Spanish town by that name, in which 1,600 civilians died, not soldiers, civilians. During the German occupation of Paris during World War II, Picasso kept a large photo of Guernica on the wall of his studio. A Nazi officer once saw it and said, so it was you who did that? To which Picasso applied, replied, no, you did it, right? So meaning, you're the ones who killed all those people in Guernica. I said, no, you're a Nazi. You guys did it. The one we have here. The model for Picasso's famous piece, Dove, 
which we saw earlier really quick, created for a peace congress held after World War II, was one of the French artist Matisse's birds. Posters of it were all over Paris when Picasso's daughter was born. He named her Paloma, which means Spanish for dove, right? Symbolism. So now we know the dove painted picture before this chapter is his daughter. Okay. All right, so the reading's over, all right? Maybe a little quicker this week because we didn't have two people to cover. Right? Here we go. Question one. As a youngster, what did Picasso do instead of his schoolwork? Did he dance in class? Did he get up and start singing? Did he do cartwheels? What did he do instead of his schoolwork? Next, what did Picasso write on his self-portrait before he left for Paris at 18 years of age? What did he write? Kilroy was here or XOXO? Hug kiss, hug kiss. Three, he lived poorly in Paris, but when he saved enough money, what did he spend his money on? Hamburgers, alcohol, Beautiful women, what did he spend his money on? Four, what was his favorite favorite motto? Life is not important or life is good. That's actually the Korean LG motto. Life is good. Every time I turn on the TV, uh, that's what I see. Okay, five, how did Picasso feel about how much a painting sold for? So what that means is, what did he feel was the important component to setting a high price, okay? It was something important that was maybe outside of the artistic skill itself. Six, if he saw a woman he liked, he would walk up to her and say what? Uh, excuse me, what time do you have? Or what's your horoscope sign, or do you speak Spanish? What would he say to these women? Seven, list the ways Picasso would entertain his four children. Okay, so there's a list of things here. I think maybe at least four, maybe five. So again, for the new students, my older students know the routine. If you only list one here, this is, this is good for your test practice. List the ways, right, and not the way. So if you list one, I won't give you zero, but I'll give you the least amount of points. If you list two, I'll give you more than the person with one. Uh, a lot of times if the list is really long, like it's six things, I, you don't have to name all six, but, you know, at least four. So the more you list, the more points you get. Easy peasy. Hey, what kind of diet did he have? Was he, what is it, keto friendly? Was it uh, paleo? Was he a vegetarian? Or did all he eat was uh, desserts? Nine, what did he say about driving? There's too much traffic, or I love to speed. What did he say? And 10, our last question for this week. Right before he died, what did he tell his doctor? Did he say, hey, doctor, how much is the bill going to be to save my life? Was that what he said? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like I said, that's the end of the reading. That's the end of the questions. So let me hear the stop share. All right. So again, this lesson is for May the 15th. And, uh, you know, it's always a Monday, so I will let you guys go and uh, talk to you the following week. Bye-bye.